Over the last 24 hours, in the face of what I suspect has been an extremely strong backlash against some of the projects to support Ukraine that we've been hearing about from various European leaders, there are the first telltale signs of a rowback. I don't want to put too much onto this. Perhaps statements that we've been getting from France and Germany might imply that some of the riskier plans are being reconsidered, or perhaps, as we've seen on so many occasions, they're just signs of people trying to pull the wool over our eyes as the plans for deeper escalation mature. But anyway, there are, or so it seems to me, some indicators of a roadback, and I will come to that later in this programme. But firstly, let's return to the situation on the battlefronts in Ukraine, because as I've discussed many times, this um, is, you know, the main driver of events. There continue to be, by the way, as I've noticed, some people who continue to insist in defiance of all fact that we're still in a stalemate situation in Ukraine. They continue to say, well, if you look at the maps, the situation hasn't changed so much. Avdevka has indeed been captured by the Russians. Um, they've managed to capture a number of villages, um, and that's all that they've achieved at enormous cost. But most of Ukraine still continues to be, as it always has been, under Ukrainian control, and so do the big Ukrainian cities. Kharkov, Kiev, Zaporozhye, Dnepro, Lviv, and all the others. And of course, that is true. But I have to say straight away that people who say this, and I've seen various articles that have been trying to resurrect over the last couple of days the recently discredited stalemate theory, People who say this, I think, are not familiar with the situation, the actual situation on the front lines, which is not of a stalemate at all. It is of Ukraine taking appalling losses as it tries to cling on to defences that steadily crumble, with the Russians alternating their locations of attack as they continue to conduct aggressive attrition. And this is unsustainable, and Western governments have begun to understand, in fact, do understand, that this is actually the case. But anyway, let's, let's go back and talk about the situation on the front lines. Firstly, um, there's been more reports now from Avdeevka, and they all combine to confirm that the situation um, in the front line west of Avdevka, the front line that the Ukrainians have hurriedly improvised uh, around the villages of Toninka, Orlovka and Berdichi, that that front line is now crumbling and crumbling fast. And we can say this now with some confidence because we've had a fair amount of videos from the area which show us where the fighting is taking place. And these videos confirm the Russian positions. And it does seem as if most of Toninka has now been captured, together with most of the areas around it. It looks as if the Ukrainians are just clinging on now to some places in Toninka. And the same also appears to be true of Orlovka. Orlovka being, as I've said already, in my opinion, perhaps the most important of these three villages, if the Russians are fully able, are able fully to capture and consolidate control of Orlovka, then the entire defence line built around these three villages collapses. But we've also had um, film from Berdichi, which is the village which the Ukrainians apparently, uh, well, have defended most intensively 
um, where perhaps most of their best troops have been located. And there was some claims a few days ago that the Ukrainians had actually driven the Russians entirely out of Berdichi. But the latest film shows Russian soldiers well inside the territory of Berdichi. And again, it looks to me as if when one puts all the pieces together, the Russians seem to be in control of a, around three quarters of this village. So to repeat what has happened over the last week, 10 days or so, um, after the fall of Lastochkino, Russians advanced, did a, a, a rapid advance, um, appeared to have seized these three villages, Berdichi, Orlovka, Toninka. Sirsky ordered a counterattack. He pulled together all the best forces that he could find, the 47th Mechanized Brigade, the 3rd Assault Brigade, what is left of the otherwise shattered 110th Brigade, the 71st Jaeger Brigade, all of these units thrown in to conduct a counterattack. The counterattack was, in its own terms, successful. The Russians were pushed back to some extent, in all three of these villages. They might have been driven entirely out of Bernici, so I think that's unlikely, but certainly they lost control of stretches of these two other villages, Toninka and Orlovka. And then, as repeatedly happens, the Russians bombed the Ukrainians in all three of these villages, um, intensively, and they shelled the supply lines to these three villages, and they carried out drone strikes um, against the uh, Ukrainian troops and supplies being sent to these three villages along the roads. By the way, I understand that there are pictures from the roads, especially the one leading into Toninka, which shows large quantities of Ukrainian uh, vehicles, armoured vehicles, and apparently um, trucks littering the roads uh, as they've been smashed by Russian uh, drone and bomb attacks and artillery strikes um, as this fighting has been underway. I ought to say I haven't seen these film, these film um, uh, properly. I have seen one film but I'm going to say straight away it was to a book sort that I really couldn't make much sense of it. So, um, but anyway, I'm taking that from third parties who've seen these films and, you know, whose comment about this are reliable. But anyway, the point is that the Russians uh, have counterattacked. They've now, after repelling the Ukraine or stopping the Ukrainian counterattack, they counterattack themselves. And it now looks as if they're well on the way to clearing these three villages entirely. I don't know how long this is going to take, perhaps a couple of days, but it seems to me that more than likely all of these three villages will soon fall fully and conclusively under Russian control. Now, where does that leave the future battle? There are some claims that the Ukrainians have bought themselves time through all this fighting, that they've successfully held um, these villages um, for a short time, and that this has enabled them to build some kind of fortified lines along a river barrier further west. And um, this time that they have gained, therefore, works to their long-term advantage. I want to stress again, I don't know what Russian plans are, and I don't think anybody does. Maybe the Russians do intend to advance beyond this river uh, towards Pakrovsk, further west. Um, maybe instead they, pre they prefer to advance to the northwest towards Ocheretenye, which is apparently on a hill, which dominates the landscape, and then veer uh, northeastwards to uh, 
take Ukrainian positions elsewhere in Donbass under some kind of envelopment operation. I mean, I don't know. That might be too complex and, ambi uh, uh, um, and ambitious an undertaking. It's the kind of thing that, as I've come to realize, those of us who are not military people, we like to draw these arrows showing advances, <laughs> great sweeping, outflanking maneuvers. But the military people who have to worry about logistics, <laughs> flank attacks, and things of that kind are generally much more cautious about them. Uh, as I said, I'm not able to discuss this and say what plans the Russians have. And for the record, I don't think anybody outside the Kremlin and the Russian general staff knows either. But one way or the other, if the Ukrainians are indeed establishing defences along this river barrier. I expect that they are improvised and hurriedly built defences, and I don't think they will stop the Russians. They might slow them down for a couple of days or weeks, but I doubt that they can change the situation on the, this part of the battlefield fundamentally. Whereas the loss of some of Ukraine's best troops in the incredibly intense fighting we have seen in Avdevka, in the Avdevka area, for control of these three villages, the loss of some of the men of the 47th Mechanized Brigade, the 3rd Assault Brigade, the 71st Jaeger Brigade, all of these elite brigades that have been trying to stem the Russian advance in this area, well, I suspect that the loss of those men is of far greater significance and a much greater cost for Ukraine than any possible gain that it might have achieved by digging up a few trenches along a few relatively small water barriers. Just say. Anyway, heavy fighting in the Avdevka area. The Russians once again on the attack. The counter the Ukrainian counterattack took them by surprise. They've spent time and effort reorganizing. The Russians have done. Now they're back on the attack. And it seems to me that they're reasonably close now to storming and clearing these three villages. And then they will advance further west towards this water barrier and perhaps they will cross it or perhaps they won't. I'm going to come to a few thoughts and points about this fighting shortly. Anyway, elsewhere it's much the same story. Um, there's been a lot of discussion and reports about what is going on north of Avdevka and south of Bakhmut, Krasnogorovka. Um, Nobody disputes that there is intense fighting going on for control of this small town, a small fortified town, uh, around 14,000 people before uh, the start of the current part of the conflict in February 2022. It's not been entirely clear, however, how far advanced the Russians have got in this area, but we're now starting to get increasing amount of film and pictures and reports from Krasnogorovka, and it increasingly looks as if the Russians have indeed managed to capture a certain part of Krasnogorovka, the southern uh, areas of Krasnogorovka, south of a railway line. There's a picture, there's a film, which appears to show Russian tanks north of the railway line heading towards Krasnogorovka, but it looks as if this tank column did not cross this railway line inside Krasnogorovka itself. It advanced towards Krasnogorovka.
the Russian positions further east, which are already north of the railway line. And it also seems that the Russians have been escalating their attacks on the two villages to the north of Krasnogorovka, Pervomaisky and uh, Nevolskoy. Um, and quite likely, before long, these two villages, I say before long, over the next couple of days, or perhaps one or two weeks, these two villages will fall under Russian control as well. Now, this is perhaps important because the commentator, known as Big Sash, who is one of the most insightful military commentators about the direction, the conduct of the war, he's done a fairly detailed discussion of what happened in Avdevka. And he's pointed out that the Russians did not attempt to create a cauldron around Avdevka any more than they attempted to create a cauldron around Bakhmut or uh, Severodonetsk, Lysychansk, that creating cauldrons encircling these places entirely is an enormously complex and costly exercise and uh, very difficult to execute in this type of war and that the Russian tactics in storming these places is different and in Avdevka they appear to have perfected them. Uh, this is basically this way of approaching the storming of these towns is to take control of the surrounding locations, the village to the north, Pervomaisky and Nevolskoy, in the case of Krasnogorovka, gaining control of some suburban areas in the south. That was what happened in Avdevka, and we see it happen again with Russian control of the southern parts of Krasnogorovka. And then suddenly, the Russians attack and collapse Ukrainian defences within the town by attacking from multiple directions at the same time. And that is exactly what happened at Evdevka. There was the Russian advance from the south, the one that was facilitated by that famous incident of the advance through the pipe, and then a, a sudden Russian advance from the north, which in effect cut Avdevka in two, leading to the collapse of Ukrainian defences inside the town. And it looks to me as if the same pattern is repeating itself in Krasnogorovka again. So the Russians are now in control of the south, of this town, holding their positions there apparently successfully. They're now starting to move tanks and armoured vehicles across the fields, looking like they're preparing another strike against Krasnogorovka from the east, and they're working to gain control of the villages to the north. Now, if this is the Russian approach, and I think it is, and there's a number of things to say. Firstly, it's clear that the Russians still have some way to go. They haven't, for example, completed control their their attempts to capture the two villages and the two important villages in the north. Pervomaisky, in particular, large place. There's intense fighting still going on there. The Russians appear to control most of this village, but they have not fully secured complete control of it. And Novosko is a smaller place, but it seems that so far uh, the Russian attacks on Novosko have been of a limited nature. The village, like Krasnogorovka, has been heavily bombed, but probably the Russians want to complete the capture of Pervomaisky first before they clear up Nevolskoy. Anyway, so 
probably this battle of Krasnogorovka still has some way to go um, before the Russians act to bring it to a conclusion. Again, this is based very much on the analysis and theories of Big Serge, which it seems to me have been supported by what the Russians have done previously um, over the course of this conflict. The other thing to say is that, of course, launching an attack of this kind, multiple directions, collapsing a defence suddenly, and Big Serge makes the point that when the Russians pushed into Avdeevka simultaneously, in effect, from the south and from the north, Ukrainian defences in Avdeevka became quickly very disorganised and collapsed within the space of about a week. Well, part of the reason for doing things in that kind of way is to conserve manpower. That the Russians, contrary to all the things we have been reading about meat assaults and human wave assaults, and Big Serge has made the point, by the way, that there has never been a single film published that shows a human wave assault by the Russians, by the Ukrainians, by anyone in this war. But anyway, um, um, the point is that these sort of attacks appear to be designed to reduce casualties as far as possible amongst the Russians. And Big Serge, again, has discussed this at length with Avdevka, where the Russians appear to have brought these tactics to perfection, if you prefer, or at least to an optimal or very high level. They've been improving them all the time. Um, this is a more sophisticated operation than, say, Bakhmut a year ago. And clearly, the Russians have learnt a lot about how to conduct street fighting from the fighting in Bakhmut. I'll come to that in a moment. But anyway, the, the purpose of this is to conserve manpower. And one of the most interesting points, again, that um, Big Serge makes is about the small tactics, small unit tactics that the Russians use in storming towns that um, initially what are called storm units and um, former militia units are deployed to make the initial breakthrough and then the heavier, more heavily armed professional troops move in and the numbers of men in these units is relatively small but with the Ukrainian defence being broken and disorganised, that becomes... Uh, the, these, these, these attacks with relatively small groups of men at any one point can be deadly in their effectiveness. Anyway, that was used by the Russians in Avdeevka. And I remember how one of my best sources described the way in which the Wagner forces were conducting assaults in, urban, in the urban setting of Bakhmut. And one could see how what we're seeing now, as I said, developed much further in Avdevka, has been brought to perfection, if you like, based on the previous experience in Bakhmut. I remember him discussing how the um, Wagner forces used to send uh, units made up of limited, uh, mainly convicts, with very limited training to conduct the initial assault, and then the Wagner fighters would then move in um, in order to clear up afterwards. And it looks like we've seen the same pattern this time, except that this time the people who call, carry out the storming attacks, the initial attacks from the 
Donbass militia and the storm units are far more highly trained than was the case during the Bakhmut fighting. So this has been an evolving story, and we're beginning to see something similar happen in Krasnogorovka. I am going to suggest that the priority of the Russians at the present time in this sector is not to advance beyond the river line um, west of Avdevka, but to complete the capture of Krasnogorovka. And this is an area where all of this intense fighting is taking place. Now, there are other places where fighting is also happening in this general area. Um, we now have more confirmation that the Russians are indeed well on the way to storming and capturing Georgievka, west of Marinka. There is a water reservoir um, in the eastern part of Georgievka, or outskirts of Georgievka, which formed something of a water barrier. The Russians have apparently now managed to gain full control of all of the territory around this water barrier, and this makes their advance towards Georgievka and beyond Georgievka towards Kurakovo, which lies further some distance further west. Anyway, they appear to be um, making significant pro progress in achieving that. And, well, we haven't actually had much news from um, the village of Novomikhailovka, south of um, Marinka, but there is every reason to think that the battle for that particular village is coming to an end and that the Russians are in the process of capturing it. Now, again, there is a kind of checkerboard quality to this. Um, it seems to me that the best analogy here is not so much with chess as with checkers, where you gradually control squares and capture pieces through, basically through movement. And we see this happen because, of course, if the Russians capture Gergievka and the village to the west of Gergievka, whose name I have forgotten, but which is probably an easier village to capture once Gergievka has been captured, then that puts them within striking distance of Kurakovo, which is an important town, Ukrainian-held town, to the west. And if the Russians capture Krasnogorovka after they've captured um, these other places, Pervomaisky and Nevolskoy, then that puts them in a good position to attack Kurakovo from the north. And again, we see how the game of attacking urban locations from multiple directions, starts to assert itself. So we could see again the checkerboard game that is being played has been played here. So you gain control of various villages around Avdevka, including the small village of Krasnogorovka to the north. Then you launch a multiple uh, Vojdane to the south and Opitnoye those sorts of villages around Avdevka. Then you launch, suddenly, a multiple strike on Avdevka from multiple directions. You then capture Avdevka. You're then in a stronger position to start capturing ground further north, uh, further south, around Krasnogorovka. You can start launching attacks towards Pervomaisky and Nivolskoy. You're then having captured Marinka to the south, you're able to launch attacks to the north towards uh, Krasnogorovka. You're then in a position to launch multiple attacks against Krasnogorovka. That puts you in a position to attack Kurakovo from the north, 
and from the east, even as you are advancing from Gergevka and eventually are putting yourself in a position to strike at um, Kurakovo from the south and east. So multiple attacks with the Russians, as I said, pursuing a kind of checkerboard approach to the way in which they conduct operations. And I'm going to suggest again, and not for the first time, that this is a reflection of the local topography. I've discussed the geography of Donbass in many programs, though not for a while, but briefly, it is an industrial area created around, originally in the 19th century and early 20th century around coal mining. Um, the result was a large number of small iron and coal towns created, which became a hub for, for, for heavy industry. In that, it is very like the Ruhr in Germany. <coughs> there are some bigger towns, like Donetsk, for example, and, um, well, to some extent, Slavyansk, Kramatorsk, um, in another part of uh, Donbass. But overall, this is a relatively densely populated and urbanized area, but one made up not so much of big cities like, say, Kharkiv, but rather of large numbers of relatively densely populated um, industrial, small industrial towns. And this is an ideal, provides an ideal defense line because Ukraine can fortify these towns, establish complex defenses around them. This area is crisscrossed by railway lines, which also form natural uh, defense lines. There are also rivers and streams, as there are, by the way, in the Ruhr. That's also an important feature of these early industrial geographical hubs. And this whole area lends itself very well to defence if there is time to create effective defence lines. There is no other part of Ukraine that resembles Donbass. So it is unsurprising that it is taking the Russians time and that they have to adapt themselves to these checkerboard tactics in order to capture Donbass. But they are making steady, systematic progress in doing so. And as they move westwards and the populated centres become thinner, the progress is likely to start to accelerate. Eventually, the Ukrainians will run out of towns, fortified towns, and will run out of space once places like Pokrovsk, Kramatorsk, Slavyansk fall, there is really nothing left of significance that lies between the Russians and the Dnieper. And I've discussed in many programs the existential threat that you, it would be for the Ukrainians if the Russians were to arrive at the Dnieper in this particular area. So this explains a great deal about the fighting. Now, speaking about railway lines, one of the most important things to understand about this war is that both sides, both the Russians and the Ukrainians, use railway lines to support the logistics of their forces. Um, this is less the case, I understand now, amongst NATO armies, but the Russians still heavily rely on their railway lines, on their railways, to keep their, to move their troops and their equipment uh, 
from place to place and to keep them supplied. And one of the effects of the capture of Avdevka is that potentially it opens up further railway lines for control by the Russians. And the same, obviously, is true of Krasnogorovka as well. If the Russians gain control of the railway lines in this area and the fall of Avdevka, like the fall of Bakhmut before, advances that objective, then they're able to move much larger quantities of men and machines through Donbass to whatever location they want to strike at. I saw one suggestion that they could move large numbers of men and machines from Avdevka to Kupiansk within the space of a day if the railway lines from Avdevka are fully through Avdevka are fully secured and of course repaired. And I'm going to suggest that perhaps rather than entertain ambitious plans to advance towards Pakrovsk, the probable initial objective of the Russians, given that they have to conduct this checkerboard offensive in Donbass, is to gain control, secure control of the railway lines and pushing the Ukrainians westward across this river barrier capturing Ocheretinia, which is itself a town on a railway line, that those are the primary objectives that the Russians have at the present time. And the same applies in the Bakhmut area as well. Bakhmut itself, as I discussed at length, at the time when the battle for Bakhmut is underway, it was underway this time last year, is an important road and railway junction. The Russians gained control of Bakhmut itself last year in the fighting in the first half of 2023. They didn't secure the area around Bakhmut fully, and this is probably the primary objective at the moment. Can I just say that over the last few months, we have seen that the Wagner forces were correct not to try to capture the three villages of Khromovo, Bogdanovka and Ivanivska, but rather to attack and capture Bakhmut before those three villages were taken. Many, there were many discussions about why the Wagner forces did not attempt to capture these three villages and to take the Ukrainian troops in Bakhmut into a cauldron. And, well, we've seen how strong Ukrainian defences were in these three villages. Khromovo, the Russians have been able to capture fairly quickly. Ivanevska, which is surrounded by heavy forest barriers, very heavily forested areas, and which is close to the main Ukrainian supply base in this area, which is Chasov Yar, by contrast, has proved very difficult to capture, and Bogdanovka as well. The Russians do seem to be close, however, to capturing Chasov uh, uh, Ivanivska, and that opens the way to Chasov Yar. That will, in turn, secure the position in Bakhmut, making it finally possible to restore and use the railway lines. And Chasov Yar itself, it turns out, is an important railway junction. And we have this now from um, um, a um, Russian military uh, person, um, our old friend, Lieutenant Colonel uh, Anatoly Matvichuk, 
I discussed him. I talked about him. Uh, I think yesterday, he's discussed recently. He's a colonel, a retired colonel of the Russian army, and he discusses the importance of Chasov Yar. He says the capture of Chasov Yar allows us to move into and take control of the infrastructure regions and the supply lines through which Ukrainian forces receive reinforcements and new munitions, as well as the access to the Kramatorsk area. By approaching Chasov Yar, we completely disrupt the stability of the Ukrainian defences and pave the way for advancing on Kramatorsk and Slavyansk. And then he goes on to explain that uh, Chasov Yar is an important highway and railway hub and um, that um, gaining control of it um, will eventually mean that not just Ukrainian supplies, the ability of the Ukrainians to keep their own troops supplied in this area will be damaged, but that it will become much easier for the Russians to supply and concentrate their troops in this area as well. So this is just a little bit of a discussion about the nature of the fighting in Donbass. It has been like this, I should say, from the time when the Battle of Donbass began in, a, in earnest around April, May 2022. The pace of events has accelerated markedly in recent weeks. The Russians have been able to advance much more quickly than they did, gaining control of these fortified towns, um, gaining more and better access to the railways, um, improving their infrastructure uh, infrastructure, and supply position because the Ukrainian forces have gradually and steadily weakened and of course the Russians have now been able to commit their air force to the fighting and we have seen the massive amount of damage that the bombing is doing on the Ukraine, the, the defences that the Ukrainians have tried to create, well, have created in this area. So, there we go. I think, as I said, in my own view, for what it's worth, is that probably the priority for the Russians is not to advance towards Pakrovsk, but to complete the capture first of Krasnogorovka, Chasov Yar, in the Bakhmut area, and then Kurakovo, uh, west of Marinka. And once they've done all of these things, that will put them in a much stronger position. And they can then consider further advances towards Pakrovsk, and ultimately towards Slavyansk and Kramatorsk, and perhaps, and most, and perhaps also importantly, towards Vugladar in the south. I accept that because logistics, which is something I was involved in in the past, is something I understand better than battlefield tactics. It may be that I'm overemphasizing the importance of the railway lines. But, well, I have to say that without logistics, without a secure logistics chain, and a secure supply chain, which is what railways do provide. I, I, I can't see how the Russian forces can advance faster without experiencing heavy losses, since they would not be able to bring over, overwhelming force to bear. To repeat once again, and it's a point I've made again in the past, once this checkerboard of small towns, 
and river obstacles and railway lines in Donbass is brought under Russian control, the way opens for the Russians to advance to the Dnieper, and then the true crisis of Ukraine will begin. And that now brings me to what's been going on in the West. Well, firstly, it's clear to me that there's been a major backlash in France against uh, Macron's uh, suggestions that there should be French troops sent to Ukraine. And we've had this comment from the French defence minister, um, uh, Stéphane, a uh, foreign minister, St sorry, for the French foreign minister, Stéphane Sejourne, uh, she uh, has said that the French will not die for Ukraine. We will not send troops into combat there because the framework has been set, which is to prevent Russia from winning without going to war with Russia. And nothing is excluded within this framework. And she said that over the course of a news conference, talking to journalists. This even as the French army conducts major drills. And this, to some extent, mirrors some comments that have now been made by the German defence minister, Boris Pistorius, who has come across to me, by the way, as both an intriguer, a schemer, intriguing against his boss, Olaf Scholz, um, and in terms of the conflict in Ukraine, by German standards, an arch hawk. Anyway, it's clear that the Germans have been badly shaken by the revelations, or rather the publication of the recording of the discussion of the four German generals, blithely chatting about missile strikes on the Kerch Bridge with German missiles um, programmed possibly by the Germans, perhaps by the British, and further missile strikes on Russian positions in Russia itself. Anyway, there's been, again, a significant backlash in Germany against this. And also there has apparently been something of a backlash in Germany against the um, comments that President Macron has been making. And Boris Pistorius is now quoted as saying, nobody wants to send troops into Ukraine. Of course, such con discussions continue, but they should stop. That's a clear signal to Macron. You're going on and on harping upon this is deeply unhelpful. Please stop talking about it. And then Pistorius goes on to say, now, let's move to an, another aspect. Long-range missiles. We have always emphasized that such long-range missiles will not solve this crisis. Such missiles could help at one point or another but Germany does not intend to cross the decisive line and is not ready to supply Taurus missiles. And that was said by Boris Pistorius in a joint press conference with the Finnish Defence Minister, Antti Hakanen. Now, that seems very clear-cut. French saying no combat troops to be sent to Ukraine. Germany's, Germans saying French... German defence minister saying no Taurus missiles be to be sent to Ukraine. Should we take this seriously? After all, they've said all kinds of things in the past. They've sent no tanks to Ukraine, and they've sent supplied tanks. They said no fighter jets to Ukraine, and, well, I'm not going to get into the F-16 saga. In my opinion, it's turning into something of an embarrassment, but... Anyway, a commitment to supply F-16 fighter jets to Ukraine has been made. There was, again, 
lots of talk about no attackums missiles to be sent to Ukraine, and attackums missiles were indeed sent to Ukraine, though only in limited quantities. So are we entitled to take these comments by Pistorius and Sejul seriously? Well, I think the first thing to say is that undoubtedly there has been a backlash. And I should say that all governments, French government, the German government, amongst every other government, take regular soundings of public opinion. They will have all kinds of private polling data communicated to them. And I suspect that polling data is overwhelmingly negative about all of these ideas, about sending tourist missiles to Ukraine within Germany, about sending German personnel to help in programming these missiles, and above all, about sending troops to Ukraine. And of course, this is to some extent confirmed by the publicly released polling data, but to my knowledge, governments can often receive polling data that is a lot more detailed and in some ways a lot more informative than the publicly released polling data also is. And of course, they must also be aware of sentiments within their militaries. So some German officers might be happy to discuss Taurus missiles being supplied to Ukraine and the Germans being involved in programming these missiles. But it's likely, at least, that some other German officers, senior officers within the German military, are not. And they know the condition of the German army and they're not at all keen to go to Ukraine and end up going there and fighting the Russians. And, well, I'm sure the same is true in France. Not only is the French public opposed to this idea, but I suspect that many French soldiers, officers, familiar with the true state of the French military, uh, pale at this idea, and that isn't even taking into consideration the enormous risks involved in adventures of this kind. But unfortunately, it has to be said that the way in which Western governments have responded in the past to these sort of barriers to escalation is that they wait and then they chip away public opinion and they try to circumvent it and find ways round. And eventually, of course, they always do. And they always have. Now, I don't know what's going to happen in Germany, but we can still see that in France. Because despite Pistorius's admonition to Macron to please stop talking about the idea of sending French troops to Ukraine, Macron is still going around talking about it. Now, he's doing it in a subtle way. Firstly, he's talking about sending a French military mission to Moldova, which is, of course, immediately to the west of Ukraine. It's a neighboring country to Ukraine. It is currently going through a major political crisis, of course, in the vocabulary of EU leaders. Any political crisis in a former Soviet republic is entirely and exclusively the product of Russian actions, European or Western actions, play no role in it, <laughs> even though, if we look at the situation in Moldova, the level of Western interference in that country, as in Ukraine, is off the scale. I'm not saying that the Russians haven't been involved as well, by the way. Recently, Putin had a meeting with a leader of one of the disaffected regions within Moldova. But anyway, always these stories, Moldova and of course Ukraine, the stories are much more complex than Western and European leaders pretend. 
and again to a great extent the instability in Moldova is a product of Western pressure and interference in that country. But anyway, the fact that that instability exists uh, is providing Macron with an excuse to send French troops to Moldova. Not so far from Ukraine, not so far, most importantly, from Odessa itself, the big, the big key city on the Black Sea coast. <laughs> now, he's also, he also made a really bizarre comment. He met, there's a picture of him meeting people in France, and he's quoted as saying that, you know, the fact that he says that everything is on the table, every possibility should be considered, doesn't mean that he necessarily intends to do that which he is talking about. He's merely floating the idea of sending troops to Ukraine. He's not actually made the decision to do that. An absurd comment, by the way, and one that no one should take seriously. But again, it looks as if he's, to some extent, trying to row back. But then again, he went on to say that maybe eventually French troops will be sent to Ukraine, but in a non-combat role, which, if you think about it, is not so different from what Sejun said. Now, let me say clearly and at once that this is a disastrous idea. Now, George... Beeb and Anatole Lieb Lieven have recently um, done uh, um, a really good article in Responsible Statecraft called the U Europe's Last Ditch Clutch at a Ukrainian Victory. And they analyze in detail all of these various schemes and plans. And they say that Francis Macron raise the idea of Western troops entering the fray. Others want to send long-range missiles. It's all folly. It's an excellent article. As uh, By the way, every article that George B. has been involved in has been, at least over the last few months. Anyway, it's an excellent article. It points out how utterly misguided all of these plans and schemes are. It makes one point, for example, that launching missile attacks on Russia is not going to achieve anything that devastating, I'm quoting now from the article, devastating the Russian economy would require bombardment on the scale of the campaigns against Germany and Japan in 1943-45. Actually, it would require far bigger bombing offensive than that. Than that. I mean, look at the size of Russia. Compare that with Germany and Japan. And you immediately understand how absurd this whole idea is. And then, anyway, Beeb and Lieben then go on to say, which is completely beyond NATO's means, unless we simultaneously destroy ourselves by launching a nuclear war. And they go on to say that the danger is that if the Ukrainians manage to hit a very high-profile target like the Kremlin, or kill a large number of Russian civilians in a single strike, the Russian government might feel impelled to escalate quite radically in response. And of course, it would be even worse if, as we now know, the Germans and the British and the French, it, would know, it is now known, are involved in these kind of strikes. And they go on to say that already many Russian hardline, hardliners are asking publicly how long Putin is going to tolerate NATO massively arming Ukraine without retaliating directly against NATO countries. And, of course, in his recent presidential address, Putin pointedly reminded Western leaders that if there are long-range missile strikes on Russia, Russia has the capability 
to launch long-range missile strikes against targets in Western countries and has much more powerful hypersonic missiles than any Western country, including, by the way, the United States has. But then, and then, um, Bieb and Lieben go on to say the West could then find itself with the worst of all direct, uh, of all worlds, direct clashes with Russia and a probable world economic crisis. That is an understatement, by the way. I cannot imagine how markets would respond to a situation where the Russians and the Europeans were hurling missiles at each other. That would not save Ukraine from defeat. And then they go on to say that launching missiles backwards and forwards might actually intensify a pressure to deploy ground troops to Ukraine. But, um, and then they discuss the entire theory of deploying NATO troops to Ukraine. And they say that it might, does not necessarily mean sending them into battle with Russia, should the Russians break through. It is possible to imagine, this is where I want to make my own comment, it is possible to imagine NATO nation troops being sent to preserve a rump Ukraine by holding Kiev and a line well to the east of the Russian advance as the basis for proposing a ceasefire and peace negotiations without preconditions. And this would, however, imply the much greater loss of Ukrainian territories to prevent an unintended battle with Russian forces, uh, uh, which, uh, which would take this would take extremely careful and transparent talks with Moscow. Western generals would be deeply unwilling to send their troops deployed without air cover, but with NATO and Russian air forces both operating over Ukraine, the chances of an aerial clash would be very high indeed. To eliminate the risk of NATO being drawn into war with Russia, Western governments would not only have to compel Ukraine to accept a ceasefire, but most likely order the Ukrainian army to fall back to NATO lines, which many Ukrainian soldiers would probably be doing anyway. There would then have to be a demilitarized zone between the two sides patrolled by United Nations troops. Now, setting this all out, surely the problems with this whole scenario are obvious. We're told that there would have to be transparent talks with the Russians. In other words, <laughs> what would have to happen is that Western governments, which up to now have refused to discuss Ukraine with Russia at all, would have to go to the Kremlin, talk to the Kremlin, to the Russians, and say, look, we're not prepared to negotiate with you about the terms for peace of Ukraine. We're not prepared to talk about um, the security situation in Europe or Western Eurasia, the, the sort of topics that you want to talk about. What we want to talk about instead is entry of our troops into Ukraine. We want you to agree to the entry of our troops into Ukraine because we don't want to fight you there. And therefore, we want you to just let us come in with air cover as well in a place where you have overwhelming military preponderance and which you have said you strongly oppose that country, Ukraine entering NATO, we want you somehow to agree to NATO troops entering Ukraine. Well, why would the Russians agree to that? Surely, the straightforward response from the Russians 
is a straightforward no. Now, the one valuable point that Levin and Beebe are making, if only implicitly, is that the only remotely plausible scenario whereby NATO troops could be um, sent to Ukraine would be with some kind of agreement from Moscow. If, say, French troops were to enter Ukraine without Russian agreement, there would be no discussions between the Russians and the French at all. Then, of course, French commanders, European commanders, NATO officials would have no way of knowing one way or the other how the Russians would respond. The Russians, in fact, have said how they would respond. They would regard those troops, those NATO troops, as enemy combatants and would feel free to attack them. And they have the long-range missiles, strike missiles, and they would attack them. Now, would NATO militaries be prepared to take those kind of risks, get themselves involved in a deep, direct confrontation with the Russians? Well, I have to say it's possible, but on the face of it, perhaps unlikely. Beeb and Levin are saying that you can only introduce troops into Ukraine safely with the consent of the Russians. But then we come back to the question, why would the Russians consent? Would they not, as I said, much more likely, in fact, almost certainly, say no? And, of course, if you are going to talk to the Russians, why talk to the Russians about something like this, which they're almost certain to reject, and which, merely by floating, you are increasing massively the risks of a military confrontation with Europe's most powerful military power, which also happens to be a nuclear superpower. Why talk about crazy schemes like this? Why not talk about something else? Why not talk about peace in Ukraine? Why not talk about not just a ceasefire, but a general peace, recognising that Ukraine will not join NATO, for example, accepting that fact, accepting that the Russians will con retain control of Crimea, Donbass, all of those territories, perhaps seeing whether or not a more substantive discussion or conversation can be ha held with the Russians about all of those questions. Now, there's also been another article, uh, this time in Foreign Affairs, by those two stalwarts of the Council for Foreign Relations, Samuel Chara and Jeremy Shapiro. And they talk about how to pave the way for diplomacy to end the war in Ukraine. And they say no negotiations yet, but it's time to talk about talking. And they're in effect making exactly the same point that I have been making in programme after programme. I don't know at the moment what the Russians would do if the Western countries came along and suggested discussions about Ukraine. Now, various people... Keith Smith to um, reopen a rather sore subject have suggested that the Russians, embittered by the consistent bad faith they have been shown by the West, almost certainly will refuse substantive discussions with the West about Ukraine that by this point, they've reached that position where they say to themselves, we're winning the war, we're going to achieve our objectives, 
through military means. And as far as the West is concerned, they're no longer agreement capable. Any agreements we've reached with them in the past, they've distorted and twisted to mean the opposite of what they appear to mean. And or they've just straightforwardly walked away from. They've deceived us time and time again. And let's just go on and win the war, which is what we are now doing. Now, it could be that that is the stance that the Russians will take if the Western powers approach them. More likely than not, it is. But how can you be sure unless you talk to the Russians? And that, it seems to me, is what Charap, Charap and Shapiro are saying. They're saying, you know, put aside plans for Ukraine at the moment. There's no point in wasting time thinking about what the future of Ukraine might be, because whatever that future is going to be, it would have to be agreed by the Russians. And of course, whatever the agreement, the form of the agreement is going to take, we can be sure that it's going to be a lot less uh, beneficial for the West and for Ukraine than the Istanbul Agreement was. So let's instead just sit down and talk and find out what is in the Russians' mind. And I agree. <laughs> I, I'm not saying, as I said, it's going to work. Perhaps if I was advising the Kremlin, I would be telling the Kremlin, well, just don't take these people seriously. They've deceived us so many times in the past. It really doesn't make any sense to talk to these people. Perhaps in order to keep the Chinese and the Indians and the Turks and happy, we should at least listen to these people, but let's just carry on with the war and string them along as in the past they've strung us along and press on and achieve victory. Perhaps that is the stance the Russians will take. More likely than not it is, and one could see why from their point of view that might be the right approach. But looking at this from the Western side, doesn't this make sense? Put aside all these far-fetched, ridiculous plans, dangerous, reckless, misconceived plans of sending long-range missiles to Ukraine. Forget about sending troops to Ukraine. Uh, even the very fact that people like Beeb and Levin are saying, well, the only real way, realistic way you can do that is with the Russians' agreement. That already says that you need to talk to the Russians. So why talk to the Russians about a fantastic, ridiculous plan like that? Why not talk to them instead about the real issues that this conflict has thrown up and find out if there's some way of coming to some kind of understanding with the Russians about Ukraine? As I've said in the past, we don't know fully what is in the Russians' mind. Dmitry Medvedev has been talking recently about all sorts of, you know, presenting all kinds of plans. He suggests a tiny Ukrainian rump state based around Kiev, um, uh, an isolated corner of around Lvov, all of the rest back under Russian control with Odessa. He talks openly about regime change. Maybe that is ultimately the Russian stance. Russian officials have certainly talked like that in the past. Putin has on occasion himself come very close to saying those things himself, though he has always stopped just short of doing so. But maybe that is now, after all this happened, the ultimate Russian objective. Or alternatively, the Russians might say to themselves, well, do we really want to go all the way to Lvov? Do we really want to occupy places like Vinitsa and Cherkasy, far from the centres of our own power, um, 
with our friends in India and China and Turkey really be happy if we press on and disregard proposals that stop short of these places? Who knows? Why not talk to the Russians and find that find out? Isn't that better than embarking on these crazy, reckless schemes of sending long-range missiles and deploying troops to Ukraine, which, to be straightforward about it, look to me like a clear pathway towards World War Three. Anyway, let me stress again. I'm simply discussing here what I think Western governments should be doing. There is no sign that they are doing that. They're coming up with these fantastic, incredible, reckless schemes instead. Now, they have got one other scheme, which is, it must be said, a lot less reckless and dangerous than these others, but which also looks utterly far-fetched to me, which is to buy all these arms on the international, uh, or shells rather, on the international arms market. And then two days ago, uh, President Pavel said that all the money to buy these shells now exists and that Ukraine can expect deliveries within a few weeks. And then a few Min and hours later, he was contradicted by one of his ministers. He said that the funding only to buy the 300,122 millimeter shells exists, and the rest of the funding hasn't yet put, been put together. I've already made my own view clear about the fantastic nature of this plan, which I expect to fail along with all the others. Anyway, that is one scheme that apparently the Europeans are pressing forward with. It's not going to change anything on the battle lines. It's just going to lose European taxpayers even more money for minimal return. Meanwhile, other countries around the world are trying to get the West to understand the realities. China and Switzerland have apparently tried to explain to the Western powers that this whole Copenhagen process, these succession of so-called peace conferences, which Jake Hull Sullivan put together in August and which um, have aimlessly happened one after another um, over the last few months, um, a pr process which is now close to collapse, Anyway, the Chinese and the Swiss are saying, you know, there is really no point in continuing with this process any further unless the Russians are invited to attend. How can we hold discussions about peace in Ukraine without the Russians? It doesn't make sense. Now, this is a position that China, of course, has been taking all along. Switzerland, which has veered very much towards the Western side, seems finally to be rediscovering some of its old traditions as a formerly neutral country and is making the point as well. Partly, I suspect, because the latest one of these conferences is supposed to be taking place in Switzerland and that conference is now apparently close to collapse. Well, the Chinese and the Swiss have been trying to explain this to the Western powers. Another person who tried to explain this, this time to Zelensky, was President Erdogan of Turkey. Yesterday, I spoke about how Zelensky, again, doesn't seem to want to go to be in Kiev for any length of time, and how he took a flight and went to Turkey to meet his old friend, President Erdogan. And the visuals from this meeting are terrible. Erdogan looks gloomy and furious. He apparently had an impossible meeting with Zelensky. He apparently also tried to get Zelensky to understand 
that this Copenhagen process really has hit a dead end and that the Russians must be invited to participate. And Zelensky flatly refused. He will not apparently participate in the, in the Copenhagen process himself. Ukraine will not agree to, in, under any circumstances to the Russians participating there. Well, we are at a dead end. Instead of Western leaders putting Zelensky in his place, telling Zelensky, look, this isn't working. Let's talk to the Russians now. We come up with crazy schemes. Shells bought in Sudan, probably. Um, Long-range missiles, which are only going to infuriate the Russians and provoke massive dangers. Deployment of NATO troops to Ukraine, a crazy idea, another pathway to World War III, and a guarantee of body bags being sent to Europe, European cities. And I wonder what the effect of that will be. Anyway, we come up with all sorts of crazy plans, but the idea of talking to the Russians remains taboo. I've heard it suggested now that one of the reasons for this is that European leaders are nervous that if they start talking to the Russians, that will undermine President Biden's hopes of being re-elected in the November election in the United States. And President Biden himself is not prepared to talk to the Russians because he worries that if he does that, again, his prospects of re-election might be affected also. If that is the calculus, then it sucks. But anyway, all I will say is one way or the other, and going back to what um, Beeb and um, Levin was saying, one way or the other, the priority ought to be to start negotiations now, not to wait for weeks, and months until Ukraine's situation becomes critical, until the Russians break through in the summer, as more and more people apparently think they will. Faced with the alternative of Ukrainian defeat, I'm quoting now from Levin and Beep, and running these literally existential risks, which is what these crazy schemes propose, it is essential, as we have argued in a recent paper for the Quincy Institute, the pressure for continued aid to Ukraine and statements like those of Macron be, a, a, be accompanied by a serious and credible push for a compromise peace with Russia now. And the word now is given emphasis by being put in italics. While we still have leadership, to bring to talks. This is elementary. It's obvious. And it's incredible that no one in government, none of the political leaders of the West, seem to understand it. Well, there we are. I'm going to finish my programme at this point before I start getting even more angry than I already am. Let me say once again, that you can find all our programs on our various platforms, Locals, Rumble and X. You can find our, you can support our work via Patreon and Subscribestar, links under this video. Don't forget to uh, check out our shop, uh, the, see the amazing things that you will find there, magic mugs, hats, hoodies, t-shirts, sweatshirts, all those great things. And last but not least, if you've liked this video, please remember to tick the like button and to check your subscription, um, and to check your subscription to this channel. That's me for today. More from me soon. Have a very good day.